the Geelong football team and uh, what is better, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> uh, one, one, one's done in, in old oak barrels or old sherry barrels. That's Irish, soft, mellow. That's what we're buying. But it's like us, yeah, old and mellow. <laughs> um, and uh, the, the Scottish is young and brash in American oak. Yeah, think about it, it's a nice metaphor. I'll, I'll work on it. <laughs> like your question, Lucas. So, I'm, going, I'm reflecting on an article that I had published earlier this year in the AARE blog. Uh, it's a piece that I wrote uh, for the conversation which they rejected, a uh, piece that I wrote for the age that they rejected. It's too controversial. Uh, it's, it came to my mind uh, because the Labor Party in the United Kingdom went to the last election with the policy of nationalising all private schools. And it's not something I want to do. But I wanted to make a distinction between defunding and nationalising. Okay. I don't believe all private schools should be nationalised. Some of them should be. Some of them are already nationalised in all aspects except by name. Uh, I do believe that private schools should receive public funding. Private schools that are unviable without being funded by government should transition to becoming faith-based public schools, like the UK model. Uh, that is currently in place. So I'm going to expand on those in the next set of minutes. Firstly, uh, as I've just said, most faith-based schools in the UK and other places like New Zealand, Canada, France, uh, are part of the public system. In uh, the United Kingdom, in England, uh, religious schools are all public schools. They don't charge fees and they're totally funded by the public. So what's the difference between England and Australia? Well, in England, private schools aren't funded by the public at all, and they have a tax-deductible status. They educate only around 7% of the population, whereas in Australia, uh, private schools, actually I should use the term non-government schools, uh, educate around 35% and decreasing. Uh, this situation started in 1963, as some of us might know, in a toilet block in Goulburn, in, in a Catholic parish school. Uh, the aim was by the Menzies government to bring uh, Catholic parish schools up to first world standard, because they were in th around third world standards at that time. And that began a long process of providing federal benefits to private schools. So in, and this is the important thing, in 1965, you know, 25% of all Australian students went to non-government schools and they received 25% of all Commonwealth funding. It kind of made sense, 25, 25. So what we have today, and many of us will know this and I've written about it and others have written even better articles about it, that we have a non, an unsustainable model of public funding. We had Gonski 1, we had Gonski 2, we're going to have Gonski 3, we've got a new model coming in now from the federal government. So with the federal government is now funding private schools, 75% of all federal funding goes to private schools, currently $13.4 billion. It's estimated that uh, in, by 2025 it's going to be $19 billion. Uh, in, that uh, private schools will be in a receipt from state and federal governments. We now fund all religious schools, two schools of Scientology. Scientology is banned in Germany. We fund it. Uh, their students get about 10,000 per student. Uh, 31 exclusive brethren uh, schools are publicly funded at about 10,000 per student. And uh, it's an extremist cult that breaks up families, as Kevin Wright said. The latest figures show that Australia has the fourth most privatised education system in the world, after Mexico, Colombia and Turkey. So are they really private schools? So on average, non-government schools receive $10,000 per student from combined funding from state and federal governments. And as we know, parental fees can be up to $35,000 for non-boarding. So if you're, if you're boarding in one of the uh, elitist private schools, you'd be paying $80,000 per head. And that's okay, they can pay that if they want. 
According to the former Productivity Commission, Trevor Cobold, and if you don't follow his work on Save Our Schools, you should go to the Save Our Schools website, enrol, uh, it's free, he'll send you an email each uh, week or each month where he puts out a new research brief on his investigations and his studies. He knows what he's talking about. And because he's a statistician, and I'm not. So I'm quoting his figures here. So you can see that between 2009 and 2017, public school funding adjusted for inflation actually was cut by $70 per student. So the, the FURFI, that I, and I talked about this last November in our last teacher meet, that there's never been more public funding for, for schools is untrue. It's untrue. Of course there's more public funding, gross speaking, because there are more kids. More kids mean more teachers, and teaching, as we know, is the most expensive component of schools. And more kids and more teachers means more classrooms, more schools. Uh, so that's where the new money is going into it. And on the other hand, funding for non-government schools has increased by 18% for Catholic education and 20% for so-called independent schools. And I call them so-called because they're not independent at all. So what needs to happen? So here's my plan. Shoot it down if you like. Any school that, is fun that charges fees above the schooling resource standard should automatically lose all public funding because they don't need it. They're over-resourced. So schools that are charging $20,000 in fee, for example, for fees uh, for a secondary school, uh, they're, got, they're already $15,000 above the school resource standard. They're not going to lose too many students. In fact, 25% of all students in 1963 who went to private schools paid the full fee. Those unschooled private schools unable to meet recurrent costs, in other words, they're not viable, they can become public schools. Simple. Open up their doors. And uh, the final dot point is that all, all non-government schools should lose their public funding by 10% per annum until it's down to zero, and that will give them enough time to get their shit together. Uh, if the schools can't meet their financial obligation, they can be taken over by the state and they, they become nationalised, if you like. And I'm going to argue in the final slide that this would be an actual saving of money for a Australian taxpayer over time. Remember that the current figure is $13.4 billion. That's a third of all ex public money expended on education goes to non-government schools. So the, the argument has always been, but we save money if we send our kids to private schools. Well, here's my very poor mathematics trying to work it out. So in 1965, 25% of all children attended non-government schools. They received no funding. In 2020, 35%, an additional 10%. That, in, that means $1,330,000, sorry, 1,330,000 kids are attending non-government schools. $13.4 billion funding going up to $90 billion in 2025. So for the additional 10% of students, that's currently 133,000 students, it's costing $101,000 per, per student to fund them. Do we get my mathematics, how I arrived at that? So what I've done, I've taken 10% of, of 1,330,000, divided that into 13.4 billion because that's what school choice has cost us as taxpayers every year since 1963 in, in real terms. So if 10% of students transferred across Australia, so if we removed all public funding, 10% of students are what's additional, so I would estimate that perhaps 10% might leave. That's going, to, that's going to be equivalent of about 55 students per school because there are 6,600 uh, public schools. That's about two classes, which are, or two teachers. Two teachers with on costs is about $100,000 each. That's $200,000 by 6,660 public schools. That's 1,332,000, a saving of 12.1 billion for the public each year. 
QED.